Hey guys, it's Rylan Johnson, your friendly neighborhood librarian, and uh, I'm here for Fulton County's uh, Public Library's Book Break Adult Story Time, uh, coming at you live. Um, today uh, we're going to be reading uh, The Call of Cthulhu by H.P. Lovecraft, which is a uh, classic tale of cosmic horror. Um, it's a bit longer uh, of a story than uh, than many of the other stories that well, the sto other story that I've done. So uh, uh, I'm going to spend a little bit less time on the biography today, but that's okay. Um, we'll get right into the story here in just one minute. But um, uh, before we begin, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know that it is a, a crazy time in the world right now, and um, I'm really glad to be able to do this for you um, to maybe uh, provide a little tiny bit of uh, escape uh, for you. I hope that this provides something for, for everybody who tunes in. Um, once again, this is a, uh, uh, a adult story time. Uh, we have uh, story time for kids. Uh, every day during the week, Monday through Friday, uh, in the morning. So if you're here for the kids' story time, that's the morning story time. This is for uh, the adults, for the grown-ups. Uh, and today we'll be re reading, as I said, a classic tale of cosmic horror. So, uh, so this is definitely an adult tale. Uh, so thank you all so much for joining in. Uh, I'm so happy to see you, and I can see some people joining right now. So hello, hello. Um, we have some librarians um, standing by to answer any uh, questions you might have. Um, they may be providing some links and other helpful things too. Um, but uh, I just a quick shout out to my fellow uh, librarians uh, that are helping us, uh, helping us stay connected with our, our beautiful community um, on the internet. Um, so, um, without further ado, I would like to uh, jump right into uh, a few comments about H.P. Lovecraft and his uh, biography. Um, he uh, was an American author who lived in the early part of the 20th century. He was born in 1890, and he died in 1937. Um, at the age of 46, so he died uh, young. Um, and like I said, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about his biography today. Um, uh, he was a kind of a mean old man. <laughs> by by uh, many accounts, he was not a well-liked person. Um, he seemed like kind of a jerk uh, in his personal life. Um, and he lived a lot of his life in a kind of self-imposed destitution uh, along the lines of the tortured artist trope. Um, uh, he was never able to support himself with uh, his writing um, or with his earnings as a an author and an editor of pulp magazines. Um, he was virtually unknown during his lifetime um, and all of his work was almost exclusively published in cheap pulp magazines before he died in poverty at the age of 46. Um, but his writing was influential over time, became more influential after his death. Um, uh, in his view, humanity uh, was an unimportant part of an uncaring cosmos uh, that could be swept away at any moment. Um, and these uh, his stories uh, included fantastical horror elements, uh, that represented this uh, fragile human consciousness and this fragile human state. Um, and uh, his writings were were uh, important for the development of popular horror in the 20th century, science fiction and horror, um, what we now call cosmic horror or even Lovecraftian horror, um, which is a kind of horror genre that is particularly weird. Uh, it's less focused on gore and shock and murder and that kind of thing and uh, more focused on um, strange fear of the unknown and the unexplained 
uh, phenomenon that go beyond the limits of human comprehension. Um, Lovecraft sees humans as this, these, these kind of tiny beings uh, uh, adrift in the cosmos where uh, unknown horrors lurk in the darkness between the stars. Um, it's a kind of man versus nature horror, um, but it's nan, uh, man versus nature in the sense that that the natural world that we see and perceive is only part of the story. And um, behind that perceived world, uh, there's a deeper, even more dangerous world of uh, eldritch horrors and uh, things like that that are lurking uh, that will wipe us out at any moment. Um, Horror as a genre is very popular for people. Um, personally, I have a hard time with film horror because it freaks me out so much. Um, but I, I do love um, uh, horror and literature. I can kind of I can take that. Um, but uh, it, it's an interesting question, and perhaps one for the comments and in, in the doobly doo below. Uh, you know, if you are a fan of horror, um, what is it about horror that that speaks to you personally? Why do you enjoy it? Um, it's a it's a strange question, you know, because uh, watching a, a horror movie, even if you enjoy it, isn't always a comfortable experience. It it, it makes us feel afraid. It makes us uh, nervous and anxious. Um, but there's a sense that after uh, we go through the the horror movie or the the, the dark tale, um, we get to a point where there's a a certain kind of catharsis where we feel relieved that it's over, or we feel better, we feel better to uh, better equipped to to face uh, the madness of real life um, when we can abstract uh, horror in these different art forms and deal with it in a safe space. Um, so uh, a couple before we go into the story, just a couple of things, uh, a couple of uh, maybe other works that are in the contemporary imagination that maybe uh, you can try. Um, of course, we all know Th Stranger Things, which is on Netflix, is a particularly Lovecraftian tale. Um, uh, Annihilation, I think, is particularly uh, Lovecraftian. It was a film version uh, starring Natalie Portman that came out a couple of years ago. But it's also uh, an excellent book by um, Jeff Vandermeer. It's a series of three books. And Annihilation is the first one. Um, I really love that 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 series, so I would definitely recommend that to people. Um, Midsummer, I think, is kind of borderline uh, Lovecraftian because it deals with a kind of cult mythos and things like that. Um, if anybody has any other suggestions, um, please feel free to leave those in the comments. So thank you so much. Um, so. Um, we're going to uh, move on now to The Call of Cthulhu. Ah. Um, this story of, is in the public domain. Um, so uh, you can find it on the internet uh, for free. When something is in the public domain, what that means is, is that it is no longer bound by copyright. So anybody can see it, and it means that you can find it very, very easily on, on the internet if you just type in uh, The Call of Cthulhu. Um, so if you'd like to read along with us, uh, I, you could type that into your browser right now if you're on an actual laptop computer um, and read along with us. Um, uh, it's pretty easy to find. Um, also, um, if you are... Um, uh, uh, you should have uh, my words. Sometimes my words run away from me. Uh, on our virtual platforms uh, for Fulton County Public Library, these are Libby and Hoopla. Uh, there are anthologies of H.P. Lovecraft's work, which are available for checkout. So if you're interested in the work of H.P. Lovecraft, go online, go to Libby, uh, go to Hoopla, and just type in his name in a search, and you'll be able to find um, some stuff there for you. Um, if you are joining us from library systems around the country, um, I know that your libraries are, are uh, doing the same kinds of things that we are, uh, making uh, works available on the internet for you guys too. So check that out, support your local public libraries. And uh, without further ado, I will take a little water. Ooh. Because it's a long story. 
we will begin with the call of Cthulhu. So, the call of Cthulhu by H.P. Lovecraft. Um, it begins with a little uh, quote from a uh, a uh, supposed source, uh, Algernon Blackwood, who says of such great powers or beings there may be conceived a survival a survival of a hugely remote period when consciousness was manifested perhaps in shapes and forms long since withdrawn before the tide of advancing humanity forms of which poetry and legend alone have caught a flying memory and called them gods monsters mythical beings of all sorts and kinds so uh, this is the first part of the story it's called a horror Part one, a horror in clay. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its content, contents. <clears throat> we live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The scientists, the sciences, excuse me, each straining in its own direction have hitherto harmed us little, but someday the piecing together of dissociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our frightful position therein that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. Theosophists have guessed at the awesome grandeur of the cosmic cycle wherein our world and human race form transient incidents. They have hinted at strange survivals in terms which would freeze the blood. Excuse me, I'm messing with my little thing here. Uh, in, uh, in terms which would freeze the blood if not masked by a bland optimism. But it is not from them that there came the strange glimpse of forbidden eons which chills me when I think of it and maddens me when I dream of it. That glimpse, like all dread glimpses of truth, flashed out from an accidental piecing together of separate things. In this case, an old newspaper item and the notes of a dead professor. I hope that no one else will accomplish this piecing out, certainly, if I live. I shall never knowingly supply a link in so hideous a chain. I think that the professor, too, intended to keep silent regarding the part he knew, and that he would have destroyed his notes had not sudden death seized him. My knowledge of the thing began in the winter of 1926-27 with the death of my granduncle, George Gamel Angel, Professor Emeritus of Semitic Languages in Brown University, Prod Providence, Rhode Island. Professor Angel uh, was widely known as an authority on ancient inscriptions and had been frequently uh, been uh, resorted to by the heads of prominent museums so that his passing at the age of 92 may be recalled by many. Locally, interest was intensified by the obscurity of the cause of death. The professor had been stricken whilst returning from uh, the Newport boat, failing suddenly, as witnesses said, after having been jostled, um, uh, coming from one of his queer dark courts on the precipitous hillside which formed a shortcut from the waterfront to the diseased home, deceased's home in William Streets. Physicians were unable to find any visible disorder, but concluded after perplexed debate that some obscure lesion of the heart induced by the brisk ascent of so steep a hill by so elderly a man was responsible for the end. At the time, I saw no reason to dissent from this dictum, but laterally, I am inclined to wonder, and more than wonder, 
As my granduncle's heir and executor, for he died a childless widower, I was expected to go over his papers with some thoroughness, and for that purpose moved his entire set of files and boxes to my quarters in Boston. Much of the material which I correlated will later uh, will be later published by the American Archaeological Society, but there was one box which I found exceedingly puzzling and which I felt much averse from showing to other eyes. It had been locked, and I did not find the key till it occurred to me to examine the personal ring which the professor always carried in his pocket. Then, indeed, I succeeded in opening it, but when I did so, seemed only to be confronted by a greater and more closely locked barrier. For what could be the meaning of this queer clay boss relief and the disjointed jottings, ramblings, and cuttings which I found? Had my uncle, in his latter years, become credulous of the most superficial impostures? I resolved to search out the eccentric sculptor responsible for this apparent disturbance of an old man's peace of mind. The boss relief was a rough rectangle, less than an inch thick and about five by six inches in area, obviously of modern origin. Its designs, however, were far from modern in atmosphere and suggestion, for Although the vagaries of cubism and futurism are many and wild, they do not often reproduce that cryptic regularity which lurks in prehistoric writing. And writing of some kind, the bulk of these designs seem certainly to be. Though my memory, despite much familiarity with the papers and collections of my uncle, failed in any way to identify this particular species or even hint at its remoteness, remotest affiliations. Above these apparent hieroglyphics was a figure of evidently pictorial intent, though its impressionistic execution forbade a very clear idea of its nature. It seemed to be a sort of monster, or symbol representing a monster, of a form which only a diseased fancy could conceive. If I say that my uh, somewhat extravagant imagination yielded simultaneous pictures of an octopus, a dragon, and a human caricature, I shall not be unfaithful to the spirit of the thing. A pulpy, tentacled head surmounted uh, a grotesque and scaly body with rudimentary wings, but it was the general outline of the whole thing which made it most shockingly frightful. Behind the figure was a vague suggestion of a cyclopean architectural background. The writing accompanying this oddity was, aside from a stack of press cuttings, in Professor Angel's most recent hand, and uh, made no pretense to literary style. What seemed to be the main document was headed Cthulhu Cult in characters painstakingly printed to avoid the erroneous reading of a word so unheard of. The manuscript was divided into two sections, the first of which was headed 1925, Dream and Dream Work of H.A. Wilcox, 7 Thomas Street, Providence, Rhode Island. And the second, Narrative of Inspector John R. Lagrassi, 121 Beanville Street, New Orleans, Louisiana. At 1908 AAS meeting, notes on same and Professor Webb's account. The other manuscript papers were all brief notes and some of them accounts of the queer dreams of different people, some of them citations from theosophical, theosophical books and magazines, notably W. Scott Eliot's Atlantis and The Lost Lemuria and the rest, the rest comments on long surviving secret societies and hidden cults with references to passages, passages in such mythological and anthropological source books as Frazier's Golden Bough and Miss Murray's Witch Cult in Western Europe. The cuttings largely alluded to outre mental illnesses and outbreaks of group folly or mania in the spring of 1925. The first half of the principal manuscript told a very particular tale. 
it appears that on March 1st, 1925, a thin, dark young man of neurotic and excited aspect had called upon Professor Angel bearing the singular clay bas relief, which was then exceedingly damp and fresh. His card bore the name Henry Anthony Wilcox, and my uncle had recognized him as the youngest son of an excellent family, slightly known to him, who had latterly been studying sculpture at the Rhode Island School of Design and living alone at the Fleur de Lis building near that institution. Wilcox was a precocious youth of known genius but eccentricity, and had been um, from child childhood excited and had from childhood, excuse me, excited attention through the strange stories and odd dreams he was in the habit of relating. He called himself psychically hypersensitive, but the staid folk of the ancient commercial city dismissed him as merely queer. Never mingling much with his bind, he had dropped gradually from social visibility and was now known only to a small group of esthetes from other towns. Even the Providence Art Club, anxious to preserve its conservatism, had found him quite hopeless. On the occasion of the visit, ran the professor's uh, manuscript, the sculptor abruptly asked for the benefit of the host's archaeological knowledge in identifying the hieroglyphics, hieroglyphics on the bas relief. He spoke in a dreamy, stilted manner which suggested pose and alienated sympathy, and my uncle showed some sharpness in replying, for the con conspicuous freshness of the tablet implied kinship with anything but archaeology. Young Wilcox's rejoinder, which impressed my uncle enough to make him recall and record it verbatim, was of a fantastically poetic cast, which much of, must have typified his whole conversation, and which I have since found highly characteristic of him. He said, It is due indeed, for I made it last night in a dream of strange cities, and dreams are older than brooding tire, or the contemplative sphinx, or garden-girdled Babylon. It was then that he began that rambling tale which suddenly played upon a sleeping memory and won the fevered interest of my uncle. There had been a slight earthquake tremor the night before, the most considerable felt in New England for some years, and Wilcox's imagination had been keenly affected. Upon retiring, he had an unprecedented dream of the of great cyclopean cities of titans, blocks and sky-flung monoliths, all dripping with green ooze and sinister with latent horror. Hieroglyphics had covered the walls and the pillars, and from some undetermined point below had come a voice that was not a voice, a chaotic sensation which only fancy could transmute into sound but which he attempted to render by the almost unpronounceable jumble of letters, Cthulhu, Flitragon. This verbal jumble was the key to the recollection which excited and disturbed Professor Angel. He questioned the sculpture with scientific minuteness and studied with an almost frantic intensity the bas relief on which the youth had found himself working. Chilled and clad only in his night clothes, when waking had stolen bewilderingly over him, my uncle blamed his old age, Wilcox afterwards said, for his slowness in recognizing both hieroglyphics and pictorial design. Many of his questions seemed highly out of place to his visitor, especially those with, uh, which tried to connect the uh, latter with strange cults or societies, and Wilcox could not understand the repeated premises, uh, promises of silence when, which he was offered in exchange uh, for an admission of membership in some widespread mystical or paganly religious body. When Professor Angel became convinced that the sculptor was indeed ignorant of any cult or system of cryptic lore, he besieged his visitor with demands for future reports of dreams. This bore regular fruit. 
For after the first interview, the manuscript records daily calls of the young man, during which he related startling fragments of nocturnal imagery, whose burden was always some terrible cyclopean vista of dark and dripping stone with a subterranean voice or intelligence shouting monotonously in enigmatical sense impacts, unscribable save as gibberish. The two sounds most frequently repeated are those rendered by the letters Cthulhu and Rylich. Uh, on March 23rd, the manuscript continued. Wilcox failed to appear, and his inquiries at his quarters revealed that he had been stricken with an obscure sort of fever and taken home, uh, taken to the home of his family in Waterman Street. He had cried out in the night, uh, arousing several other artists in the building, and had manifested since then only alternations of unconsciousness and delirium. My uncle at once telephoned the family, and from that time forward kept close watch on the case, calling often as the Thayer Street at the Thayer Street office of Dr. Toby, whom he learned to be in charge. The youth's febrile mind apparently was dwelling on strange things, and the doctor shuddered now and then as he spoke of them. They included not only a repetition of what he had formerly dreamed, but touched wildly on a gigantic thing, miles high, which walked or lumbered about. He at no time fully described this object, but occasionally, uh, but occasional frantic words, as repeated by Dr. Toby, convinced the professor that it must have been uh, identical with the nameless monstrosity he had sought to depict in his dream sculpture. Reference to this object, the doctor added, was invariably a prelude to the young man's subsistence, uh, subsidence into lethargy. His temperature, oddly enough, was not greatly above normal, but the whole condition was otherwise such as to suggest true fever rather than mental disorder. On April 2nd, at about 3 p.m., every trace of Wilcox's malady suddenly ceased. He sat upright in bed, astonished to find himself at home, and completely ignorant of what had happened in dream or reality since the night of March 22nd. Pronounced well by his physician, he returned to his quarters in three days, but to Professor An uh, Angel, he was of no further assistance. All traces of strange dreaming had vanished with his recovery, and my uncle kept no record of his night thoughts after a week of pointless and irrelevant accounts of thoroughly unusual or thoroughly usual visions. Excuse me, this is a long story. Thank you for uh, hanging out with me and bearing with me. Um, <clears throat> continuing on here. The first part of the manuscript ended, but references to certain uh, of the scattered notes gave me much material for thought. <clears throat> Uh-oh, my thing went away. Thank you so much for, for bearing with me. I had a little thing, all the, my, my thing. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Here, the first part of the manuscript ended, but references to uh, certain of the scattered notes gave me much material for thought. So much, in fact, that the uh, that only the ingrained skepticism then forming my philosophy can account for my continued distrust of the artist. The notes in question were those descriptive of the dreams of various persons covering the same period as that which young Wilcox had had his strange visitations. My uncle, it seems, had quickly instituted a prodigiously far-flung body of inquiries amongst nearly all of the friends whom he could question without impertinence, asking for nightly reports of their dreams and the dates of any notable visions for some time past. The reception of his request seems to have been varied, but he must, at the very least, have received more responses than an any ordinary man could have handled without a secretary. The original correspondence was not preserved, but his notes formed a thorough and really sufficient digest. 
average people in society and business, New England's traditional salt of the earth, gave an almost completely negative result. Though scattered cases of uneasy but formless nocturnal impressions appear here and there, always between March 23rd and April 2nd, the period of young Wilcox's delirium. Scientific men were little more affected, though four cases of vague description suggest fugitive glimpses of strange landscapes, and in one case there is mentioned a dread of something abnormal. It was from the artists and poets that the pertinent answers came, and I know that panic would have broken loose had they been able to compare notes. As it was, lacking their original letters, I half suspected the compiler of having asked leading questions, or of had edited the correspondence in corroboration of what he had latently resolved to see. That is why I continue to feel that Wilcox, somehow cognizant of the old data which my uncle had possessed, had been imposing on the veteran scientist. These response, responses from Thetes told a disturbing tale. From February 28 to April 2nd, a large proportion of them had dreamed very bizarre things. The intensity of the dreams being immeasurably the stronger during the period of the sculptor's delirium. Over a fourth of those who reported anything reported scenes and half sounds not unlike those which Wilcox had described, and some of the dreamers confessed acute fear of the gigantic nameless thing visible toward the last. One case, which the note describes with emphasis, was very sad. The subject, widely known, uh, a widely known architect with leanings towards theosophy and occultism, went violently insane on the date of young Wilcox's seizure and expired several months later after incessant screamings to be saved from some escaped denizen of hell. Had my uncle referred to these uh, eases by name instead of uh, merely by number, I should have attempted some corroboration and personal investigation. But as it was, I succeeded in tracing down only a few. All of these, however, bore out the notes in full. I have often wondered if all of the subjects of the professor's questioning felt as puzzled as did uh, this fraction. Uh, it is well that no explanation shall ever reach them. The press cuttings, as I have intimated, touched on eases of panic, mania, and eccentricity during that uh, given period. Professor Angel must have employed a cutting bureau, for the number of extracts was tremendous, and the sources scattered throughout the globe. Here was a nocturnal suicide in London where a lone sleeper had leapt from a window after a shocking cry. Here, likewise, likewise, a rambling letter to the editor of a paper in South America, where a fanatic deduces a dire future from visions they'd seen. A dispatch from California describes a theosophist colony as donning white robes en masse for some glorious fulfillment which never arrives, whilst items from India speak guardedly of serious unrest toward the end of March. Orgies multiply in Haiti, and outposts report ominous meetings. American officers in the Philippines find certain tribes bothersome about this time, and New York policemen are mobbed by hysterical Levantines on the night of March 22nd and 23rd. The west of Ireland, too, is wild, is full of wild rumor and legendary, uh, legendary, excuse me, and a fantastic painter named Ardoise Bonnois hangs a blasphemous dream landscape in the Paris Spring Salon of 1926. And so numerous are the recorded troubles in insane asylums that only a miracle can have stopped the medical fraternity from noting strange parallelisms and drawing mystified conclusions. A bunch of weird cuttings all told, and I can at this date scarcely envisage envisage the callous rationalism with which I set them aside. But I was then convinced that young Wilcox had known uh, of the other older matters mentioned by the professor. Part two, 
uh, the tale of Inspector Legrassi. Uh, how's everybody doing? I know that this is a longer story than usual, but I really, really appreciate you guys hanging out with me for a little while. It's, it's, it's very, very cool. Uh, and uh, I hope that you're doing good. Let me know in the comments. Um, okay, part two, the tale of Inspector Legrassi. Let me get a little water. <clears throat> the older matters which had uh, made the sculptor's dream and the boss relief so significant to my uncle formed the subject of the second half of this long manuscript. Once before it appears, Professor Angel had seen the hellish outlines of the nameless monstrosity, puzzled over the unknown hieroglyphics, and heard the ominous syllables which can be rendered only as Cthulhu. And all this in so stirring and horrible a connection that it is small wonder he pursued young Wilcox with queries and demands for data. The earlier experience had come in 1908, 17 years before when the American Archaeological Society held its annual meeting in St. Louis, Professor Angel, as befitted one of his authority and attainments, had had a prominent part in all of the deliberations and was one of the first to be approached by the several outsiders who took advantage of the convocation to offer questions for correct answering and problems for expert solution. The chief of these outsiders, and in a short time the focus of interest for the entire meeting, was a commonplace looking middle-aged man who had traveled all the way from New Orleans for certain special information unobtainable from any local source. His name was John Raymond Legrassi, and he was by profession an inspector of police. With him he bore the subject of his vis visit a grotesque, repulsive, and apparently very ancient stone statuette whose origin he was at a loss to determine. It must not be fancied that Inspector Legrassi had the least interest in archaeology. On the contrary, his wish for enlightenment was prompted by purely professional considerations. The statue, idol, fetish, or whatever it was, had been captured some months before in the wooden swamps south of New Orleans during a raid on, the supposed, uh, on a supposed voodoo meeting. And so singular and hideous were the rites connected with it that the police could not but realize that they had stumbled on a dark cult totally unknown to them and infinitely uh, more uh, diabolic than ev ev excuse me, even the blackest circles. Uh, of its origin, apart from the erratic and unbelievable tales exhorted from the captured members, absolutely nothing was to be discovered, hence the anxiety of the police for any antiquarian lore which might help them place the frightful symbol and uh, through it track down the cult to its fountainhead. Inspector Legrassi was scarcely prepared for the sensation which his offering created. One side of the thing had been enough to throw the assembled man of science into a state of tense excitement. And they lost no time in crowding around him to gaze at the diminutive figure whose utter strangeness and air of genuinely abyssal antiquity hinted so potently at unknown, uh, excuse me, unopened and archaic vistas. No recognized school of sculpture had animated this terrible object yet centuries and even thousands of years seemed recorded in its dim and greenish surface of unplaceable stone. The figure, which was finally passed slowly from man to man for close and careful study, which was uh, between seven and eight inches in height and of exquisitely artistic workmanship, um, it represented a monster of vaguely anthropoid outline but with an octopus-like head whose face was a mass of feelers, a scaly, rubbery-looking body, prodigious claws on hind and forefeet, and a long, narrow uh, wings behind. This thing, which seemed uh, instinct uh, with a fearsome and unnatural malignancy, was a somewhat bloated, 
corpulence, excuse me, and squatted evilly on a rectangular block or pedestal covered with uh, undecipherable characters. The tips of the wings touched the black edge of the block. The seat occupied the center, while whilst the long curved claws of the doubled up crouching hind legs gripped the front edge and extended a quarter of the way down toward the bottom of the pedestal. The cephalopod head was bent forward so that the ends of the facial feelers brushed the backs of the huge forepaws which clasped the croucher's elevated knees. The aspect of the whole was abnormally lifelike and the more subtly, subtly fearful because its source was so totally unknown. Its vast, awesome, and incalculable age was unmistakable, yet no one, uh, yet not one link did it show with any known type of art belonging to civilization's youth or indeed any other time. Totally separate and apart, its very material was a mystery. For the soapy greenish black stone with its golden or iridescent flecks and striations resembled nothing familiar to geology or mineralogy. The characters along the base were equally baffling, and no member present, despite a representation of half the world's expert leaning, uh, learning in the field, could form the least notion or even their remotest linguistic kinship. They, like the subject and material, belonged to something horribly remote and distinct from mankind as we know it, something frightfully suggested of old and unhallowed circles of life in which our world and our conceptions have no part. And yet, as the members severally shook their heads and confessed defeat at the inspector's problem, there was one man in that gathering who suspected a touch of bizarre familiarity in the monstrous shape and writing, and who presently told, with some diffidence, of the old trifle he knew. This person was the late William Channing Webb, professor of anthropology at Princeton, and an explorer of no slight note. Professor Webb having been engaged 40 years before in a tour of Greenland and Iceland in search of some runic inscriptions which he failed to unearth. And while high, high up on the West Greenland coast he had encountered a singular tribe or cult whose religion, uh, a curious form of devil worship, chilled him with its deliberate bloodthirstiness and repulsiveness. It was a faith uh, of which others knew little and which they mentioned only with shudders, saying that it had come down from horribly ancient eons before even uh, ever the world was made. Besides nameless rites and human sacrifices, there were certain queer hereditary witch rituals addressed to a supreme elder devil or Tornasuk and of this, Professor Webb have taken a careful phonetic copy of an aged, from an aged uh, angicock or wizard priest, expressing the sounds in Roman letters as best he knew how. But just now, the prime significance was the fetish with which the cult had, uh, which this cult had cherished, and around which they danced when the aurora leapt high over the ice cliffs. It was, the professor stated, a very crude bas-relief of stone comprising a hideous picture of s and some cryptic writing, and as far as he could tell, it was a rough parallel in all essential features of the bestial thing now lying before the meeting. These data, received with suspense and astonishment by the assembled members, proved doubly exciting to Inspector Legrassi, and he began at once to ply his informant with questions. Having noted and copied an oral ritual amongst the swamp cult worshippers his men had arrested, he besought the professor to remember as best he might the syllables taken down among the diabolists. There then followed an exhausted comparison of details, and a moment 
of really odd silence when both detective and scientist agree on the virtual identity of the phrase common to two hellish rituals so many worlds distant apart. Uh, uh, it's a bunch, it's a very difficult word. Finglui Minglaf Cthulhu. <laughs> It's one of those things that's probably better read. But for you guys, Cthulhu is part of it. Uh, Lagrassi had one point in advance of Professor Webb, for several among his mongrel prisoners had repeated to him what other older celebrants had told him the words meant. The text is given ran something like this. In his house at Riley, a dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. And now in response to a general urgent demand, Inspector Lagrassi related as fully as possible his experience with uh, the worshippers, telling a story to which I could see my uncle attached profound significance. It savored of the wildest dreams of myth maker and theosophist and disclosed an astonishing degree of cosmic imagination among such uh, as might least be expected to possess it. On November 1st, 1907, there had come to New Orleans police a frantic summons from the swamp and lagoon country to the south. Um, the squatters there were in the grip of stark terror from an unknown thing which had stolen upon them in the night. Uh, it was voodoo apparently, but voodoo of a more terrible sort than they had ever known, with some of their women and children had disappeared since the excuse me, malevolent uh, Tom Tam had begun its incessant beating far within the haunted woods where no dweller ven ventured. Their insane shouts and harrowing screams, soul-chilling chants and dancing devil frames, flames, and the frightened messenger added, the people could stand it no more. So a body of 20 police filling two cartridges and an automobile had set out in the late afternoon with uh, the uh, shivering squatter as a guide. At the end of the passable road, they alighted and for miles splashed on in silence through the terrible cypress woods where day never came. Ugly roots and malignant hanging noises Nooses of Spanish moss beset them, and now and then a pile of dark stones and fragments of a rotting wall intensified by its hint of morbid habitation, a depression which every malformed tree and every fungus uh, islet combined to create. At length the squatter settlement, a miserable huddle of huts, hove in sight and the mystical dwellers ran out to cluster around the group of bobbing lanterns. The buffled meat, muffled beat of tom-toms was now faintly audible far, far ahead, and a curdling shriek came at infrequent interval, intervals when the wind shifted. A reddish glare, too, seemed to filter through the pale undergrowth beyond endless avenues of forest night. Reluctant even to be left alone again, each one of the crown, crowd uh, refused uh, point blank to advance another inch towards the scene of unholy worship. So Inspector Lagrassi and his 19 colleagues, colleagues plunged on, unguided into the black arcades of horror that none of them have ever trod before. The region now entered by the police was one of traditionally evil repute, substantially unknown and untraversed. Tra there were the legends of a hidden lake unglimpsed by mortal sight in which dwelt a huge, formless, white, polypus thing with luminous eyes, and squatters whispered that bat-winged devils flew up out of caverns in inner earth to worship it at midnight. They said that it had been there before Dulberville, before La Salle, before the Indians, and before even the wholesome beasts and birds of the woods. It was nightmare itself, and to see it was to die. But it made men dream, and so they knew enough to keep away. 
<clears throat> Only poetry or madness could do justice to the noises heard by Lagrassi's men as they plowed on through the black morass towards the red glare and the muffled tom-toms. Uh, the vocal qualities peculiar to men, the vocal qualities peculiar to beasts, and it is terrible to hear when one, uh, the shore sh should yield the other. Animal fury and orgiastic license here whip themselves to demoniac heights by howls and squawking ecstasies that tore and reverberated through those nightless, nighted woods like pestilential tempests from the gulfs of hell. Now and then, the less organized ululations would cease, and from what seems a well-directed chorus of hoarse voices would rise and sing song chant that hideous phase, phrase or ritual, Cthulhu, Cthulhu, Cthulhu. Then the men, having reached the spot where the trees were thinner, came suddenly in sight of the spectacle itself. Four of them reeled, one fainted, and two were shaken into a frantic cry, which the mad cacophony of the orgy fortunately deadened. Lagrassi dished swamp water on the face of the fainting men, and all stood, stood trembling and nearly hypnotized with horror. In the natural glade of the swamp stood a grassy island of perhaps an acre's extent clear of trees and tolerably dry. On this now leaped and twisted a more indescribable horde of human abnormality than any but a sime or an anger. There's a lot of old language in this story, y'all. Um, void of clothing, this hybrid spawn were braying and bellowing and writhing about a monstrous ring-shaped bonfire in the center of which Revealed an occasional, uh, revealed by occasional rifts in the curtain of flame, stood a great granite monolith, some eight feet in height, on top of which, incongruous in its diminutiveness, rested the noxious caravan, carven statuette. From a wide circle of ten scaffolds set up at regular intervals, with the flame girt monolith as a center hung, head downward the oddly marred bodies of the helpless squatters who had disappeared. It was inside this circle that the ring of worshippers jumped and roared, the general direction of the mass motion being left to right in endless bacchanals between the ring of bodies and the ring of fire. It may have been only imagination, and it may have been only echoes which induced one of the men uh, to fancy he heard antiphonal responses to the ritual from some far unillumined spot deeper within the wood of ancient legendary and horror. This man, Joseph D. Galvez, I later met and questioned, and he proved distractingly imaginative. He indeed went so far as to hint that the faint beating of giant wings and a glimpse of shining eyes and a mountainous white bulk beyond the remotest trees but I suppose he had been hearing too much superstition. Actually, the horrified pause of the men was of comparably dr brief duration. Duty came first, and although there must have been nearly a hundred celebrants in the throng, uh, they plunged determinedly, excuse me, plunged determinedly into the nauseous route for five minutes, the resulting din and chaos were beyond description. Wind blows were struck, shots were fired, and escapes were made. But in the end, Legrassi were able to count some 47 prisoners, whom he uh, forced to dress in haste and fall in line be between the rows of two policemen. First, five of the worshippers lay dead, and two severely wounded ones were carried away. Uh, on improvised stretchers by their fellow prisoners. The image on the monolith, of course, was carefully removed and carried back by Lagrassi. Examined at the headquarters after a trip of intense strain and weariness, Hey guys, how are you doing? Is anybody going with me still? Um... 
I think I'm going, because we've been going for a little while, um, I think that I'm going to go ahead and end now um, because I've been going for almost a lot hour and it seems like this is going to go uh, on for a little while. I've, I kind of have overestimated the degree to which uh, <laughs> this story is long. I thought it was a lot shorter than it is. Um, but in any case, um, Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I, I'm going to go ahead and, and call it now before I go. I guess this is kind of the height of it. Um, also, is there's kind of a scene of violence coming up, um, and I, I kind of just feel like I'm not quite so comfortable like moving along with that. Um, so uh, I am going to say thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I appreciate you spending some time with us, um, and if you uh, if you have any questions, just uh, let us know. We'll be glad to answer them. Um, thank you so much. Take care and be good to each other. Bye.